Good day, happy summer. Welcome back to Eating the Forest. And wow, the world has burst around us and the green beings are prolific and in their glory right now. And one of the many that we'll find and that probably is growing profusely on your own yard is Prunella vulgaris or heel all, also called self heel. This cluster of little purple flowers that is a fine little edible. You can delight on the flowers themselves or pick them and sprinkle them on salads for a little color. But heel all has also been used for centuries around the world as a healing agent. A vulnerary, so um, healing to the skin, be it a skin eruption of any kind or a breakdown of the skin from a cut or a bruise, but also internally as a tea or as a tincture for spasms, for inflammation, um, also for um, antibiotics. It's been shown to um, help with E. coli in the lab. So Prunella vulgaris, a wonderful plant to know and a great cold infused tea um, a carminative, so helping to quiet the digestive tract um, and a calming agent, and just a sweet, lovely plant. <laughs> so this is a wonderful plant that's been used by gypsies and wild crafters for centuries, comfrey, or Symphytum officinal. Um, I like to look at the leaf up close. It, it reminds me of skin, like elephant skin, how it's divided and has all these just really interesting structures. And the lay term for comfrey is nip bone. So one of the ways that this plant has been used for centuries is to put this in water and let it get really soft by gently boiling and heating that water up and then squeezing the water out of the leaves and putting the soft leaves onto a broken bone or bruise, particularly bones that are close to the skin, like ribs um, or a broken ankle bone. And some of the properties of comfrey can be absorbed by the skin and really help our body to heal. So still a wonderful use of this. Comfrey has properties that help the skin to heal faster than just about anything else that we know to date. Thus, they're really great for skin breakdown. If it's really an open wound, I would not use comfrey on that just yet, but once it starts to scab over and it's a really superficial wound, comfrey will help that to heal up quickly and also minimize any scarring. So comfrey is used as a salve in my household very prolifically, um, also on random rashes or skin outbreaks. Sometimes it just seems to do the trick. Often I will mix Prunella vulgaris, the heal all, which has a, a styptic or um, antimicrobial property. So combined with comfrey, it can help to also prevent infection. Uh, calendula, something that I grow in my garden, is another that I love to mix with comfrey. Comfrey had and still is used by some people today internally. However, in 2002, the FDA banned the use of internal use of comfrey root because of peralzidine, I might have said that wrong, acids, which is shown to cause cancer in high quantities. The study that was done was using really high doses of comfrey, um, and many herbalists today believe that small doses on a regular basis are just fine, um, but the FDA does ban the internal use of comfrey. Welcome to the wild side of my garden. I tend to leave a patch of the garden wild, or a bit wild, um, every year, and this has really become the wild section of the garden, and it's really wonderful to see what comes up and what wild plants want to thrive here. And I also feel that it's helpful to the garden and with invasive species of having a variety of native plants that really seed themselves and want to be here. This, however, is one that I planted as a gift to me this spring. This is a really happy elder. Happy that she took to being planted in the really cold early April that we had, but is happily flowering now and will produce some nice berries in the next month to come. Underneath is one of my beloved 
plant allies. This is St. John's wort, Hypericum perforatum, just recently flowering. One of the ways to identify St. John's wort before they're flowering is to look at the leaf. And you can see the little perforations that are on the leaf, the little circles. And those are the glands that make some of the compounds, which are hypericum and hyperforin. Hypericum has been known and touted to be helpful in inhibiting the reuptake of certain neurotransmitters, like norepinephrine and dopamine, among others. Um, in the medical world, there's still some debate as to how efficient St. John's wort is in treating mild to moderate depression. Um, but in the anecdotal sense, many people have touted St. John's wort have been, has been hugely helpful in alleviating depression. I like to think of St. John's wort as a sun-loving plant. St. John's wort loves the sun and tends to hold on to that amazing light and intensity. There's a bit of a magical essence of St. John's wort that although there's no red or rosy color on this plant, it's really just a yellow flower, but the hypericum is actually a reddish colored juice. There we go. So inside, that's showing me, wow, there is some pretty awesome chemical compounds. One interesting thing to note about St. John's wort is the hyperferrin, a different chemical component, um, increases the metabolism uh, by some enzymes in the liver so that it inhibits the efficiency of many pharmaceuticals. So if you're taking a pharmaceutical or even birth control, if you're taking St. John's wort at the same time, it's probably decreasing the efficiency of that. Maybe only by a little bit, but I think that that's a really important piece to know. Now, St. John's wort also, oh, Kermit is <laughs> loving St. John's wort right now. Um, <laughs> it topically is an antispasmodic. So as a physical therapist, I love to make this beautiful red oil, um, which hopefully we'll do in a later session with the leaves and I will pick the leaves and flowers or the flowering tops as such and do a dry wilt and then make a lovely oil that will be brilliantly rosy red, kind of like my fingers still are, um, that topically can really relieve muscle soreness and strain. Um, St. John's wort also can be used um, dried as a tea um, and I love to make a folkloric tincture using the extraction of the alcohol alkaloids through alcohol. This is one of my favorite garden weeds. So in places like this near my peas, I let this kind of go prolifically until it really starts to take over. This is Portulaca or purslane, one of the few vegetal sources of omega-3 fatty acids and a delicious succulent. Because Portulaca grows so close to the ground, um, it's gonna have a lot of grit. So I'm gonna put a bunch in this so I can bring her back to the kitchen, give her a little rinse, and they're just delicious raw in salads and so wonderful for the body. I've never cooked purslane just because it never makes it that far. <laughs> um, when purslane flowers, there's a little yellow flower. Um, I try to not let purslane go into flower in the garden because then it'll really take over. But areas like this are just, just what I think the garden and I need as a ally to the plants here. I feel that the cultivated plants really like to have their wild constituents nearby and excellent food when weeding the garden. So a little tidbit about drying and preserving um, the plant materials that you're going to use at a later date. So this comfrey that we picked is still a little moist from the morning dew and yesterday's rain. So I have them spaced out in this basket that they can dry wilt. The comfrey I'll use within a few days, so I don't need to get all the moisture content out, but to make um, a vibrant, nice salve or to use this in other medicinal ways, I really want to get that moisture content pretty darn low. 
for the St. John's wort and the heel all, same thing. I'm putting them in this nice colander that has these spacious holes. I'm gonna leave them out in the sun to dry wilt. The, any bugs that are in there will have the chance to escape. Um, and we're gonna really decrease that um, water content. Now, if I were going to be preserving these for the whole year, I would put them out on a screen on a nice day and get them to the point where they're really brittle and dry. And I would know when there, there's no water content in them really by how they feel. If you're going, if you've picked, if you've picked a, a number of things that you want to dry and then you're going into a really damp rain cycle, you could put your um, oven on the lowest temperature possible and um, go that way. I've known some people that will do that and leave the door of the oven open a little bit to try and keep that temperature really, really low so that you're not burning out any of the constituents that you want to keep for medicine making. Um, sometimes if I'm going to be drying things or they're mostly dried but not quite ready, I'll put them in a paper bag and put some holes in there and then tie them and hang them in places in my house that are really dry and that way they won't have any um, dust on them.